Not long ago, manufacturing was the pride of this country. British firms built wonderful machines of high quality. Ships, tools, radios, TV sets, cars, motorcycles and trucks. In fact, the motor industry was once our biggest single manufacturing industry. Not anymore. This is part of what's left of the mighty Leyland Company in the town of Leyland in Lancashire after it collapsed. 25 years ago, Leyland produced 500 commercial vehicles every day. Today, like most of British industry, tens of thousands of jobs have gone forever. Of course, industrial deserts like this are not hard to find, with the exception of one industry in which Britain is still a world leader. Indeed, it has 20% of a world market, second only to the United States. And this industry is considered so important by the government that it consumes almost half of all research and development funds. Strangely, it produces not consumer goods that people want, but machines that hardly any of us use or want to use. Moreover, for all its preeminence, its future is uncertain and depends to a large degree on secret deals with some of the most corrupt and brutal regimes on earth. One of the biggest manufacturing industries in Britain at the close of the 20th century is arms. If we don't do it, somebody else will. We are, as a nation, extremely responsible in the way we export lethal weapons. This is the weapon of the 90s. Last year, for the first time, we achieved 20% of the world market for orders. This is the Manchester warehouse of the largest dealer in small arms in the world. Sam Cummings has made a fortune from selling guns to everybody and anybody. Always, of course, with government approval. The military arms business, as opposed to mm. the sporting, is based on human folly, mm. which means simply two things. Number one, its depths have yet to be plumbed. Mm. And number two, it will go on forever. Here is the famous Kalashnikov. I would say, conservatively, that over 30 million Kalashnikovs mm. have been made. That's a lot mm. of rifles. Now, who would you sell this now, to? This we have to? offered Kalashnikovs to the Gulf states the Arab states of the Gulf, as those are licensable. We sell it under HMG license only mm. to any government which qualifies for HMG licensing. But time and again, politicians stand up in the House of Commons and say, our criteria for selling weapons to so-and-so regime, of course, is based on human rights. Look, as I've said before, if the governments abided by their own weapons control laws, world peace could truly be at hand. But they won't, they never have, and I respectfully submit they never will. During the Thatcher years, the British economy was effectively militarized. One in 10 workers in industry now work on military material. The Ministry of Defence is industry's biggest customer, 
spending more than 23 billion pounds a year. In order to pay for this, Britain sells arms to almost anyone who will buy them. The biggest and best arms deals often end up here at the Ministry of Defence. The MOD runs the Defence Services Organisation, or DESO. The word sales was dropped a few years ago and the front office moved to the West End. DESO is a sort of hard sell international arms broker, overseeing 80% of British arms exports to developing countries, many of them run by unsavoury dictatorships. It wasn't the Tories that boosted the modern arms trade, it was Labour. In 1966, Dennis Healy, then Defence Secretary, set up the Defence Sales Organisation with these words. While the government attached the highest importance to making progress in the field of arms control and disarmament, we must also take what practical steps we can to ensure that this country does not fail to secure its rightful share of this valuable market. How do you feel about that statement today? I don't feel all that happy about it, but remember this was at the time when the Cold War was really at its height. Uh, there was an enormous amount of arms sales by the Soviet Union uh, all over the world in the hope mainly of getting political advantage. But for me the main thing was to reduce the unit cost of British weapons by selling some of them abroad. I'll be quite frank with you about that. But there is, I mean, there is a real contradiction in that because, I mean, how can you attach the highest importance, as you said, to arms control while at the same time really putting Britain into the competitive arms market? I don't think you can show that the setting up of this organisation greatly increased or even significantly increased our share of the world arms trade. If you want to control the arms it, trade... It didn't, have... certain, it didn't control it. And what you did by setting this up was to help organise it a little better, surely. Yes. It certainly didn't control it and it certainly give, didn't it, give the highest importance to making to... the field of arms control. No, we had... We, ha we, we didn't you set, set up that. shop. That, Listen, that's... you might just as well say that because we had military forces we were no. contributing to the arms race. No, that's quite different. No, but you could yeah. say that. A lot of people yeah. did say well, that. Well, I'm not saying that, and that's no. quite different. Well, Having now, military forces... But the sale of weapons abroad, uh, what country uh, which bought British weapons would not have bought the equivalent if we, they hadn't bought British weapons? Robert Jarman is a former government arms salesman and one of the few prepared to speak out. When Mrs Thatcher became Prime Minister, there was a definite rallying to sort of say, yes, you should be proud of what you're doing, you're exporting for the United Kingdom, you're doing a good job, and uh, her very public appearances that, for instance, the first farm brush she went to, she made it quite obvious from the moment she became Prime Minister that she was personally thought that uh, defence exporting uh, was good for the United Kingdom. If you're a favoured regime, you can pick up anything from a high-tech Challenger tank for £2.5 million each, plus VAT, to missiles to the very latest in cluster bombs. And the easiest terms are available, such as the sale to Indonesia of 24 of these Hawk fighter aircraft. The deal worked like this. Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd flew to Jakarta and offered the regime so-called aid for trade. Within a few weeks, the Indonesians said yes to the Hawks. Shortly afterwards, the government announced massive financial aid to Indonesia, a total of £81 million in taxpayers' money. This is the Cabinet Office in Whitehall. Every Thursday morning, the Joint Intelligence Committee, or JIC, meets here to discuss the latest wizard. That's Whitehall jargon for the weekly intelligence reports from around the world. Among them are highly classified reports on international arms deals, some the work of MI6 agents. They describe who is buying from whom, the terms offered, the commissions demanded, and above all, 
the potential for the British arms trade. Um, the arms trade and indeed the trade in technology were two of the principal things that were followed by the Joint Intelligence Committee. I mean, the intelligence that came in um, on, it, on technology and arms was pretty vast. I was an administrative Robin officer. Robin Robertson was a clerk in the Cabinet Office working for the Joint Intelligence Committee. And what was the, the Prime Minister's interest in, particular interest in this? I was told she was the only Prime Minister ever to attend Joint Intelligence Committee meetings. Um, so that she was obviously deeply interested in intelligence agencies. And was she especially interested in intelligence of arms deal because she's taken quite a leading role in uh, promoting arms deals. In as much as the reports mentioned the arms trade, certainly she would have known everything that the Joint Intelligence Committee knew. In 1985, Margaret Thatcher negotiated what was called the arms deal of the century. The customer was Saudi Arabia, the medieval keeper of much of the world's oil. The deal was known as Al Yamama, the Dove, and was said to be worth up to 30 billion pounds in exports of fighter aircraft, missiles and ships. But as Saudi dissidents have told us, so-called commissions could run into millions of pounds. A watchdog public accounts committee is chaired by the Labour MP, Robert Sheldon. Two years ago, Mr Sheldon's committee was worried about reports of huge bribes paid to middlemen as part of the Al Yamama arms deal with Saudi Arabia. They called for a full report from the National Audit Office, which they got and then kept secret. Why? Mr Sheldon won't say. He's seen the report, which he says, contains not a shred of evidence of improper practice. So if there's no stink, why the cover-up? Mr Sheldon won't say. And he won't be interviewed about why he won't say. And the secrecy goes on. There's to be a new investigation into the Saudi deal. But Parliament won't be told the results until 1997, if at all. In the meantime, Mark Thatcher stands accused of making £12 million in commissions from this deal as a direct result of the connection with his mother. Mrs Thatcher has made no comment, but Mark Thatcher has vigorously denied the charge. <laughs> Howard Teicher was the Middle East analyst on America's National Security Council during the 1980s. He studied top secret intelligence and diplomatic messages from Saudi Arabia in which Mark Thatcher's name appeared. On a number of occasions in the mid 80s, I saw intelligence reports from the Central Intelligence Agency, from the Defense Intelligence Agency, and also sourced to other countries' intelligence agencies. Separately, I saw diplomatic reports from the American Embassy in Saudi Arabia, which also stated that Mr. Thatcher was reported to be involved in these arms transactions. There was no doubt in my mind that uh, Mark Thatcher was a principal in the group of uh, individuals promoting the uh, UK uh, uh, arms transaction and that he undoubtedly would uh, benefit economically. What was your own reaction at seeing this? I was quite surprised to read about the involvement of the son of the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom uh, making himself a player in an arms transaction for the obvious reason that it would create the appearance of a direct relationship between the family of the Prime Minister and the transaction. Did Mark Thatcher's name appear over a, a period of time? I'd say beginning in sometime in 84 through 86, end of 86. Mm. So he uh, I can't state how many times I saw his name, but uh, I, would, I would categorize it as the frequent many tens of times different sources um, that he was clearly he was clearly involved there's no question about it could I just I showed Mr. Teicher a document whose disclosures he verified as authentic it concerns the intense competition between the US and Britain for the Saudi deal it says 
Four billion dollars was mentioned in connection with M. Thatcher's son. What kind of commission would that represent, do you think? Uh, four, on four billion dollars? Well, do the math. Five percent of four billion dollars. It's a pretty hefty commission. Hmm. So the reference in connection with Mark Thatcher is clearly a reference to his group of middlemen. Is that, is that what you're saying? Uh, what, I, what I'm stating is that the reference to $4 billion in connection with Mark Thatcher uh, relates to the amount of money uh, or the, the share of the transaction that uh, would have an impact on Thatcher's group were it subtracted from the, the yeah. total sale. Well, what would happen if this was happening in the U.S.? It would be the type of circumstance that could bring about the uh, impeachment of an elected official. There's no question about it. Unlike the United States, commissions on arms deals are not illegal under British law, but the Saudi deal raises other vital questions. Saudi Arabia is a country with almost no basic freedoms. Torture is commonplace. Women are executed for adultery. Others are publicly beheaded for changing their religion. Thousands of British jobs depend on a single arms deal with this regime, whose viciousness the British government has worked hard to disguise. Was there ever any discussion at Joint Intelligence Committee meetings or in the Cabinet Office about human rights in these countries where British arms were being sold? It wasn't a point of interest. I never remember discussions about human rights. What do you feel now about being privy to all this? I ended up feeling worried and angry that um, arms were going to regimes that were quite clearly uh, behaving in the most disgusting way towards their own people, and yet, um, it seemed that the intelligence information that should have been stopping the arms trade was possibly helping it. In fact, British arms have been supplied to some of the worst human rights violators in the world. A British-made torture chamber was supplied to Dubai. British armoured cars took part in the Sharpeville massacre in South Africa. British communications equipment helped the Ugandan tyrant Idi Amin. Today, Britain is arming Turkey, where MPs are jailed for speaking out and journalists murdered. Nigeria, where there are public executions and torture. Chile. The list is too long for inclusion in this film. According to Amnesty International, few regimes are so casual about mass murder as the Suharto military dictatorship in Indonesia. Britain is Indonesia's biggest arms supplier, selling them almost everything from rapier missiles to Hawk fighter aircraft. Following our film, Death of a Nation, about East Timor, where 200,000 people have died under Indonesia's military occupation, thousands of people wrote to their MPs and to the government to voice their concern. Some of them got these replies from the Foreign Office, replies that are models of deception. For example, the Foreign Office claim Indonesia's hawks are only trainers. But new evidence has come to light that the principal function of the hawks is counterinsurgency, identified here as coin. In other words, their main use is attacking the people of East Timor. The same kind of letters about hawk aircraft to Indonesia and saying that they had no military usage would have been sent over different items to, to Iraq. And more, more to the point, to virtually any country you want to name. Um, everyone knows that the Hawk aircraft can be utilized in an offensive way. And when the Foreign Office writes to people saying they have assurances from, in this case, the Suharto regime, mm -hmm. that the Hawks will not and are not being used in East Timor, um, 
how do those assurances compare with other assurances that you would have had direct knowledge of? They're about as worthless as a piece of paper that they're written on. People need to be well aware that at times they are being lied to. This is where Lord Justice Scott conducted his inquiry into the scandal of British arms that went illegally to Saddam Hussein. The Scott inquiry sat for 400 hours and gathered evidence from more than 200 witnesses, including the government's chief arms salesman, Ian MacDonald, who said, truth is a very difficult concept. And the ambassador to Saudi Arabia, David Gore Booth, who explained that half the picture can be accurate. Well, half the picture is what the Scott report may well produce, because perhaps half the important questions were not asked and half the people who could answer them were not called. Throughout the 1980s, billions of pounds of arms were being exported from this country to both Iran and Iraq by British companies with full knowledge of the British government in defiance of the government's guidelines and in defiance, of course, of the UN. That is a far more significant issue. And if Scott were serious about it, he ought to interview the key businessmen uh, who know about the deals because they were responsible for them, men like Sir James Blythe, uh, Sir Colin Chandler, who were past heads of the Defence Export Sales Organisation, Sir Peter Levine, Sir John Cuckney, and high-ranking MI5 officers who also uh, played a major role in all of Thatcherite arms deals in the 1980s. Margaret Thatcher's appearance was a star turn. She blamed everyone else, but was forced to admit that she had seen official papers that had made clear that arms sales to Iraq should be subject to more flexible interpretation. These were words she underlined in her own hand. Yet on April the 21st, 1989, she told the House of Commons, the government have not changed their policy on defence sales to Iraq. As the chief arms salesman said, truth is a very difficult concept. The truth is that as soon as Thatcher took power, her ministers courted Saddam Hussein. A procession of them went to Baghdad. Lord Carrington, Cecil Parkinson, John Knott, John Biffen, Paul Channon, William Waldegrave. In 1981, Douglas Hurd tried to sell Saddam Hussein an entire air defence system. And when, in 1985, Britain banned the sale of arms to Iraq, the flow of British arms and money did not stop. In 86, Alan Clark, then Trade Minister, led the way back to Baghdad. In 88, David Meller, then a Foreign Office Minister, joined Saddam Hussein on his famous visitor's couch. While Mellor was being entertained in Baghdad, Saddam ordered the gassing of 5,000 Kurds in the town of Alabja. It would look very cynical, said Geoffrey Howe, if so soon after expressing outrage over the Kurds, we adopted a more flexible approach to arms sales. After this atrocity, Trade Minister Tony Newton flew to Baghdad and offered Saddam Hussein 340 million pounds in export credits. We had files full of things about uh, the gassing of the Kurds at Halabja, and we used to draft awfully polite letters to people saying, you know, well, understand your concern, but Britain can't afford to lose out on its uh, exports and trade. There must be, said Margaret Thatcher recently, a moral basis to foreign policy. The story of the arms trade under Margaret Thatcher is exemplified by the extraordinary downfall of the Astra Company. Astra was formed in the early 1980s and throughout the 1980s grew by a series of um, acquisitions and the, the last of which was a company in Belgium called PRB, which Astra bought in uh, late 1989. 
um, it subsequently transpired that that company was involved in a whole series of contracts which were going to countries other than that um, which was stated on all the documentation and in particular that company was involved in making parts for the supergun. So the PRB was uh, involved with sending the supergun secretly to Iraq? Via Jordan, yes. Via Jordan. PRB had a contract on its books which was involved in the propellant for the supergun and that was going via Jordan. Mm. Now the, the, the new chief executive of Astra began to investigate this, didn't he? Could you tell us what happened there? Once Chris Gumbley found out about the Supergun propellant contract, both he and the former chairman, uh, Gerald James, initiated an investigation of a whole series of PRB contracts. And in particular, I believe the management were trying to find out where the substantial commission payments or, or bribes on those contracts um, were going and to whom they were going. We were in receipt of two letters from Gerald Ball. Mm. And those letters spelled out very clearly uh, that the, there were strange government activities going on. And of course, Gerald Ball himself, uh, known as the inventor of the supergun, he was murdered. He was killed an hour after Gumbly had left him, but he had made it quite clear to us uh, not only that uh, uh, we were being used extensively for covert uh, purposes, but uh, he also made it clear that uh, there was a, a vast network of corruption involved as well. In 1984, Britain and Jordan agreed an arms deal worth £207 million. Once again, a huge and secretive arms deal bore the personal stamp of Margaret Thatcher. When did your suspicions about the Jordanian deal really start to worry you? Well, quite early on, because I knew that one of our acquisitions was uh, involved in a, I thought, a relatively minor way, but uh, the magnitude of our involvement in the Jordan package, which was reported to me, was £100 million of propellant, which I think at the time exceeded our, uh, our group turnover. And you weren't aware of this? Absolutely not, no. How could you not be aware of it? Here was 100 million, if you say that was greater than the group's turnover. That's staggering, isn't it? Well, I wasn't aware of it because our, our names were being used, our note paper and uh, our name was being used for contracts which were really being operated by other people. And who were these other people? I think it was IMS, a company owned by the, uh, or what it was owned by the Minister of Defence. It was. Um, a separate organisation from defence sales, mm. which handled what I would term perhaps the more covert activities of the government. All right, so IMS was manipulating Astra to the tune of £100 million. Pounds. Yes, that, that, that's the only conclusion I could draw from, uh, from what happened and the people I spoke to who were in a very good position to know what was going on. Could, could you just give me an idea of where the equipment was ending up? Well, a high proportion of it ended up in Iraq. There are photographs showing ammunition boxes, clearly with the lettering RO as to Royal Ordnance, and uh, Iraq and the date of the letters of credit, which um, would seem to confirm that position. Used in the Gulf War? I would think almost certainly used in the Gulf War, yes. This is the carnage of the Gulf War. A shop window for the arms trade. The official truth of the war was that thanks to high-tech weapons, few people had been killed. As you saw in the Gulf War, uh, there is now an expectation that significant conflicts can be fought with minimal casualties. Yeah. And therefore, the general public, understandably, looks for greater use of selective terminally guided weapons, etc. It looks for better surveillance, it looks for better target acquisition, all of which are means of pinpointing uh, the enemy and, and, and knocking him out with the minimal amount of peripheral damage to the civilian population 
and indeed, hopefully, to the rest of the armed forces on either side. Just, uh, you, now, you, that's an expensive way. Mm. You said with minimal casualties uh, that some of the more authoritative estimates are that uh, the, uh, the numbers killed um, in and as a result of the Gulf War ran up to 200,000 people. Uh, certainly people died and every death is thoroughly regrettable, obviously, but it could have been a long protracted slogging match in which the United Kingdom and indeed the, the, the Allied mm. forces could have taken considerable casualties. Now that fortunately didn't happen because we have a greater regard for life, I think, than some other nations do. And that may be historical, it may be uh, all sorts of things that cause... Where, where, that where, how, how do you justify such a statement, which seems quite an important one, that we have a greater regard for life than other nations do? I think I, I, I merely deduce that from the fact that we are moving down the path of more intelligent weaponry, as I say, that can mm. pinpoint the enemy rather than having masses of infantry and, uh, going into combat on a, on a sort of uh, even exchange basis. In spite of the fact that perhaps 200,000 people did die in the Gulf War. Not on our side. Selling arms is really no different from selling cars or kitchenware. Welcome to the Ideal Arms Exhibition in Paris. Everyone's here. They like a tough game, no rules, some you win, some you lose. Competition good for you. They die to be free. They like order, makeup, limelight, power, game shows, rodeo, Star Wars, TV. They're the powers that be. It's a uh, Mark 19 grenade machine gun. Right. This is the latest version. What, what does it actually do? Can you can you describe that to a layman? It throws a grenade yeah. 2,000 meters. Mm -hmm. And this fragments on impact, yeah. and this right. particular one will penetrate armor plate if it were to hit I it. See. So that, that comes in, that bursts into a lot of shrapnel. Right. Then, is it? It's the infantry's artillery. Yeah. So what can it actually do against uh, against an army or against... To uh... stop it, because yeah. you're taking a limited amount of high explosive and spreading it like a shower. Yeah. All you want to do is just wet the surface. Yeah. What is the different effect of this grenade when it, say, strikes the enemy from an old-fashioned grenade? This fires out this hot copper dust, whereas the old-fashioned one shrapnel everywhere. That, that's correct. Yes. Uh, depending upon the nature and the uh, thickness of the copper uh, sheet, the energy of the grenade will extend uh, to uh, a, a given range. Yes. And beyond that range, there is no risk to the people. Yes. So you can use the grenade as a defensive grenade. <clears throat> On display here is the ERIM, the Extended Range Interceptor, which is an anti-tactical ballistic missile. It utilizes a whole different technology in that this is a hit-to-kill weapon. There is no warhead in this missile. Birmingham Barb Tape manufactures a range of security fencing products. Uh, razor wire is our core product, which has really replaced barbed wire internationally. Uh, it's a, it it rip, rips and grabs, uh, whereas barbed wire just pokes, uh, pokes holes through. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a more effective So it's product. more of a cutting wire, is That's it? exactly yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you could just tear yourself on barbed wire, but you can cut yourself on razor wire, is that it? Yeah, that, that's, that's yeah. it. Yeah, there's more yeah. points with razor wire as well. There is a camera in right. it. You have uh, all the means to transmit uh, the picture 
Yes, inside. Uh, from your head? Yes. From your helmet? Inside, yes. yes. Mm. So it's a secret, a secret camera for demonstrations? And mm, it depends on the buyer. Yeah. yeah. You, you can use in your garden. Uh, oh, of course, yes. Yeah. And you just frighten the children. Yes. The grass. <laughs> you cut the grass. The, the spikes fence, what is that meant to do? What is, uh... We believed, uh, and that's in fact uh, shown with our sales, that uh, there is a niche market for uh, uh, a more aesthetically pleasing fence topping. And that's where the spikes come into their own. They, 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 um... Spikes being more aesthetically pleasing that's than, exactly than razor yeah. wire. So it would hit uh, scuds, would it, in, a, oh, in another certainly. case? But it hits them at such, at such a level of impact. The, yeah. the mega jewel. The mega jewels are in the hundreds of uh, mega jewels. There's a lot of interest in, in these products from particularly the Middle East and the Far East at the present time in, uh, in Kuwait right. and in the UAE uh, and also by the Indonesian armed forces. Uh, essentially we sell to uh, armies which are the French army are connected with the French army. Can you tell me which armies those are? No. no. Can you tell me which countries? It's difficult for me yeah. to... And what countries, uh, apart from the US, are using it? Uh, have bought uh, we normally don't give out our, no. our uh, success stories. <laughs> We've made several demonstrations. I can't name the customers. W will you sell to anyone? Uh, we're not in the business of uh, deciding uh, who should be buying our product. Uh, yeah. and, uh, mm, business is business. This is Cambodia, where up to 500 amputations are performed every month, the result of landmines. Throughout the world, there are more than 100 million of them waiting to explode. And yet the British government has planned a military strategy of scattering mines from the air. This is often known as minks, or mines into the next century. It's called area denial. The humanitarian effect that that has is when the war is finished, those areas remain uninhabitable. But of course, returning refugees, farmers, people like that, they don't have a choice, they have to go there. The official UN figures are that 2,000 people are maimed and killed by mines every month. When uh, at the UN Security Council there was an American-sponsored vote to get an international moratorium on the export of landmines. The British government initially was going to oppose it because it became clear that this would put them in an impossible situation politically and in an embarrassing situation. In the end, they voted for the moratorium, the international moratorium, but with a rider to their vote, with a note added that this didn't apply to British mines. What we don't agree with is the complete and um, absolute ban on the use, let alone manufacture, of mines. Mines are part of the weaponry of the United Kingdom that we need for our own self-defense as a nation, and that must remain. You don't think they fall into the category of chemical weapons, nerve gas, that sort of thing. A lot of people are suggesting they are in that category. I'm answering for the United Kingdom, mm. and I'm quite clear that we need to retain in our capacity, in our national ar arsenal, mines, but they've got to be used properly so that the civilian population is not endangered, and they've got to have the capacity in the future, the new technology of mines, that they self-destruct. But I'm not going to be party... What if that doesn't work? I'm not <laughs> going to be party to any policy uh, which says uh, you must uh, abolish all mines in stock, you must not produce, you must not mm. manufacture any more in the future. We need that capability, um, devastating though that use can be, for the defence of this island. Politicians don't examine the real cost of anti-personnel mines. I'm not interested in disarmament for a political reason. I'm interested in stopping things like this. This little boy, little Afghan boy, was born in the refugee camps. I'd lived all his short life 
dreaming of going home. His mother and father and aunties and uncles had told him about Afghanistan. And finally, he was going home to his home in Ghazni. And the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees provided the transport. He was repatriated from the camps in Pakistan to his home. Within minutes of climbing out of the truck that he returned home in, he ran in the fields to look at his country for the first time in his life, and he was blown to pieces. Quite literally, he died a minute or two after this photograph was taken because somebody somewhere wanted to make a profit. This is Gearlock in Scotland. Behind me is the Trident nuclear submarine base. Neither the government nor the opposition hardly ever mention it. It's one of those gentlemen's agreements that are a feature of British democracy. The government claims that Trident cost 10 billion pounds. Greenpeace says the real figure is more like 30 billion over 20 years. Last year, the National Audit Office revealed that 800 million pounds had been wasted building facilities for Trident. That's more than the entire cost of the cuts in Britain's conventional forces announced this year. Certain items have gone up, you're absolutely right, and the works program uh, at uh, Faz Lane and, and Coolport um, was not completed satisfactorily in terms of uh, the total cost overruns. And uh, there are parliamentary reports on that, and doubtless I will be having to answer questions about that. But for the submarine itself, the missile and the warhead, the cost of that, is less than was forecast. So overall, the Trident program has cost the nation less in real resources than was forecast. Trident was built for the Cold War. So what's it for now? Well, it's said to have a new role about which the government says very little. This is known as substrategic capability. What does that mean? It means that a new threat has been found. It was best encapsulated by the new head of the CIA last year, who said that we have slain the dragon, that's the Cold War Soviet Union dragon, but we now live in a jungle inhabited by poisonous snakes. That's all the threats from the South, whether it be the Middle East, Latin America or elsewhere. And the clear indications now that Trident could have a single Trident missile fitted not with four or six large nuclear warheads, but just one relatively small nuclear warhead, say 10 to 20 kilotons instead of 100 or so kilotons. And one single missile in a crisis could, for example, be fired as a demonstration shot at some sort of putative uh, Middle East aggressor state to show it that Britain meant business. Is this a real possibility? This is talked about quite seriously in military circles in Britain, virtually never in public, but in private this is the line of thinking. There is no political debate on any of this because the government and the Labour Party have effectively the same policy. It seems to us, if you look at the real world, there are countries in the world which do not have the stability even of the Soviet Union, where you've got dictators in power who could actually cause damage on what we call our civilized West. And there are countries in the Middle East and in parts of Africa that already have missiles which can reach halfway up Europe, can reach up halfway up France. Who, who are they? Well, I mean, it's quite clear. I mean, there are countries... Um, Iraq had this sort of capability. There are countries like Libya had this sort of capability. But are you seriously suggesting that we keep Trident with its uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles to deter scuds from Iraq and uh, Libya or... Yeah, but you're not only talking about scuds, you're talking about missiles which are becoming more advanced than that. But are they likely to fire them at Britain? At the, I mean, is this a serious proposition? Well, we, we don't know. This is the real cost. It has been estimated that the money spent over the years on nuclear submarines would restore a national housing program and virtually end homelessness. It would also restore the transport system and stop the hemorrhage of teachers from schools by raising salaries to a decent level. And it would pay every outstanding bill in the health service and ensure that no one died waiting for an operation. 
It would also allow non-military research and development to catch up with the best in Europe. And what was left over could be invested in converting industry to peaceful production. In my 22 years in the defence industry, I never met one worker who said they only wanted to work in weapons. Professor Michael Cooley was a leading design engineer for the defence contractor Lucas Aerospace. In the 1970s, he helped to form a shop floor committee at Lucas, which devised a strategy to convert the arms industry to peacetime production. We, we, we did demonstrate that you could convert to peace. We certainly didn't say or pretend that it would be easy, but we did show it could be done. That required uh, the commitment of the management, the commitment of the staff, and also, I would guess, the commitment of the government to support the, the transition. In our view, it would have to be in a phase fashion. We did not see that it would be possible suddenly to cease working in arms products and then go over to civil production. But rather, one would have a phase transition from the 60% of the company's products, which at that time were military products, mm -hmm. to something like 50% and gradually down to perhaps 30%. In, in what period of time? Well, we envisaged that in about a 10-year period. What is the answer to those who say there are so many jobs involved and if we take on board conversion, there'll be so many jobs lost in the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they attempt to demonstrate that the problem of conversion is so massive that one can't even begin to address it. I simply reject that. I'm not saying that conversion is easy. I am saying it is possible. Uh, I think the great thing is to be utopian in a long-term sense and be practical in the short term. And I think it's very, very important that all human beings understand and believe that the future is not out there in the sense in which a coastline might be out there and somebody goes out to discover it. The future has yet got to be built by people like you and I and we do have real choices and the choices are becoming stark. And one of the choices is to use the skill and ability we now have. Large amounts of it concentrated in the defence industries to produce products and services which would be caring for humanity and the environment. And I don't think that's really very utopian. That seems to me to be very practical in a long-term view of what our society is now facing. This film hasn't just been about the arms business. It's the story of the Thatcher years, of the dismantling of whole industries such as mining in favour of a military economy of the contempt shown for Parliament and the people, of an obsession with secrecy and corruption, all of it conducted in our name with our money. The questions are now urgent. Who authorised the illegal sale of arms to Saddam Hussein? Who has made a fortune out of deals with other murderous dictators? And what exactly was the role of super saleswoman Thatcher and her family? Of course, for people in other countries, the issue is one of life and death. Death from British cluster bombs, life denied by money squandered on British arms they don't need. Is the end of this century going to mark the British as a people whose great manufacturing reputation has been reduced to that of making magnificent tools of death?